Um, and we're doing part 16 of the series. Galatians chapter number 3, verse 13 and 14, and then we'll read verse 29. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And verse 29 says, And if you are Christ's, or if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8, uh, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. Now, on last week, we looked at what Paul said in Ephesians chapter number 5. We dealt with the third through the fifth verses of this. We've been talking about don't be disqualified from receiving your inheritance. And we have shared that. Peter said to us over in 1 Peter that the inheritance that God has for us is undefiled, it's incorruptible, it's being laid aside for us, it's being kept in heaven, it does not waste away. And what God has for us is for us. And no one can take from you what God has for you but you can disqualify yourself from receiving what God has and so and uh, we looked at well we we've, we've been reading first Corinthians 6 9 and 10 uh, we looked at Ephesians 5 1 through 5 and uh, in this this third through the fifth verse we talked about the behaviors or sinful practices that would cause one to be disqualified from receiving their inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. And Paul dealt with uncleanness and covetousness and filthiness and foolish talk and coarse jesting. So I'm not going to get into all of that today. We talked about that last week. You can go back and, and watch that if you didn't see it or you wasn't here last week. But uh, I was about to move on from this and deal with another area of this. And remember, this is topical preaching, what we're dealing with now. We're dealing with a topic of inheritance and not, re uh, being, not being disqualified from receiving your inheritance. But I want you to go to Galatians 5 now. Because in this fifth chapter of Galatians, we, we read some things in that, you know, we... we we looked at verses uh, 19 through 21, and that basically talked about the behaviors that one, you know, practices those. You won't have any inheritance in the kingdom, but I'm going to start at verse 16. I'm going to start at verse 16, Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk in the spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, 
selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The Lord led me back to that piece right there because what we want to deal with is winning the battle within us. You know, Brother Bosey, our greatest enemy <laughs> is not Satan. It's not Satan. It's not other people. A lot of time we have a tendency to think that the white man is the greatest enemy. Not really. Not really. Not really. Mm -mm. We shouldn't think like that. Our greatest enemy is ourselves. Me. My flesh. This part of me right here. Flesh and blood part that you see when you look in the mirror that is your greatest enemy um, in these verses Paul is describing the battle that believers are faced with every day of our lives and how we are to walk in the spirit so that we do not fulfill the lust of our flesh. Notice the word spirit is spelt with a capital S. That means the Holy Spirit. Our flesh wrestles against the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is against our flesh. Mm. It's a battle. And, and the word walk in the Greek means to make one's way, to progress, to make appropriate use of opportunities. It means to regulate one's life. The word walk is present, it's in present tense. And this means that the life of the believer is a life of continuous progress. We ought to always be moving from where we are to where God wants us to be. Paul was suggesting that walking by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, should be a habit. It is to be a lifestyle. It is a constant movement toward a complete likeness of Jesus Christ. So in other words, if I got saved in 1995 and prior to my salvation, I would cuss like a sailor. I'd cuss you out at the drop of a hat. You rub me the wrong way, you're going to get cussed out. Not cursed, but cussed out. And I enjoyed doing it. Because it made me feel better. <laughs> As of 1995, so that's 29 years ago. No, I was never like that. Never like that. But I'm just using that as an example. I rather use me than one of y'all. Because, see, y'all might be thinking, he's talking about me. No, I'm using me. So, by now, all that cussing folk out stuff. It, it should be out of me by now. If I'm moving from where I am to where God wants me to be. And if I'm not moving from where I am to where God wants me to be, then I believe that's what you called Arrested development, 
I'm not growing. I'm not maturing. But I'm stuck in a place where I reach this particular area of my life. My frontal lobe has not developed any further. And I have not matured at all. I'm still just as as immature and carnal as I was when I first came to Christ. I got saved, but that's all, Brother Bozy. That's it. On my way to heaven. But that's it. There's no growth. There's no maturity in my life. And it's evident. Because as soon as you rub me the wrong way, I'm going to let you have it. And feel good after I did it. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? So we, we, we must remember that because our flesh is not saved and it won't be saved until the rapture of the church and because the flesh is not saved it is still sinful and if we don't walk in the spirit it will. Our flesh will sin. The spirit of the believer is saved. When we got born again, our spirit man was quickened. It was made alive unto God. It was regenerated and our spirit cannot sin. Our soul, which is the mind, the will, and the emotions is progressively being saved as we are renewing our minds and being renewed in the spirit of our mind, which is at the subconscious level. And the word of God is becoming implanted or engrafted in our minds, James says to us, that this is able to save our souls. Write these verses down and go back and read them this week. Romans chapter 12, verse number 2. Ephesians 4.23 and James 1.21. So, so when I'm born again, I'm instantly saved. Instantly. My spirit is saved. My soul is progressively being saved. This is why it's so important to be discipled. Uh, to come to church. To attend Sunday school. To attend Bible studies. So that we can grow. And then take the initiative uh, in, within ourselves to pick up the word of God and read it and study it daily so that we can grow. So we can grow. So that we can move from where we are to where God wants us to be. Pastor Cheryl said something that was profound when she was up here earlier. And uh, yeah, you do look fabulous. I thought I'd add that today. Amen. You, whoo. <laughs> I almost didn't know who you were when you came in my office. What this woman done? <laughs> Just walking up in my office. That's <laughs> my wife, man. <laughs> uh, you said something that was profound. That you are who you are at the core of your being. You are who you are. And when, you, when we talk about at the core of your being, the core of who you are is your spirit man and your soul, your inner man. You are who you are. And if there is no change, first of all, when you're saved, if that spirit man has not been saved, then there won't be any change. But if the spirit man is saved, born again, and the soulish man is not progressively being changed, there won't be any change. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And this is why oftentimes you see people who've been around the church for years, old snake when they first got there, came to the altar and we, we thought he got saved. But that old snake's still doing the same stuff he was doing for the last 30 years. Snaking around, snaking around, snaking around, snaking around. Do you understand what I'm saying? Still, still flirting with all the women, knowing he got a wife at home. Can I get an amen? Still flirting. Ain't no change in him. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Still drinking him a pint of whiskey every now and then, getting full. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Still smoking him some reefer and justifying it. His herbs came out of the ground. God made it. Ain't no change. Ain't no change. Ain't no change. Amen. So, now, so, so, our spirit is saved instantly. Our soul is progressively being saved. But the flesh will not be saved until the rapture of the church. When Jesus comes and he takes us out of here and we change from mortality to immortality, from corruption to incorruption. Now, this is interesting because Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 10. Listen to what he wrote. He says, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in him, talking about in Christ, who is the head of all principality and power. Now, the word complete Pepler omonia, minio, minoi, rather, I'm sorry, in the Greek, means to be made full. The Greek actually says in Christ, in him, you are full. When a person truly believes and partakes of Christ, he receives the fullness of Christ. And when we are born again, we are baptized into Christ. And this is our position. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, all right? 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we're baptized into his body. So then, what is the fullness of Christ which believers receive? What is it that we receive? If my spirit is instantly saved, and as my mind is being renewed, the spirit of my mind is being renewed, and the word of God is being engrafted into my mind, but my, my flesh is not saved. What do you mean that I am complete in Christ? Well, when we receive Christ, this is what Paul is talking about. We receive wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us uh, wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Let me read it again. 1 Corinthians 1.30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus who became, he became for us. He became for us wisdom from God and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Now, this is true in respect, number one, to wisdom, which is needful to guide us. Uh-huh, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, all right? It says, but to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is our wisdom. He is our wisdom. So when Paul says that we're complete in God, one of the first things that we have is the wisdom of God, who Jesus Christ is to us. He is our wisdom. So as I grow in him, I don't have to keep making dumb and ignorant mistakes. And decisions. If I keep making those dumb decisions, it's an indication that perhaps, but Moses, I'm not growing. Can you say amen? So number one, he is our wisdom. Number two, he is righteousness to us. Which simply means that we understand the evil in this world, both sin and death, and that we know the only way to attain righteousness is in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21. 1 
For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So positionally, I am righteous. Righteousness has been imputed to me. It has been imputed to you. When you were born again, God declared you as righteous. That is the position that you're in with God. You're righteous. Number three, he became sanctification. Our sanctification, which simply means that our lives are set apart from the world and sin and set apart unto God to live for him and serve him. We are a holy people. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning, listen to this, chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. You were chosen by God from the very beginning for salvation through sanctification. Can I get an amen today? Sanctification. I'm set apart. When I got saved, instantly set apart from the world. Set apart from sin. Set apart unto God. That's who I am. That's my position. That's how I stand with God. Sanctified. That's how God sees me as sanctified. Glory to God. Here's the fourth thing. To redemption. We've been saved from corruption and death and given eternal life. Listen to this. Ephesians 1, 7 and 8. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. So in Christ, we are complete. God has given us everything that we need to live this life and godliness. Second Peter 1, 3. We've been given everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness. We have everything that we need. Are y'all getting this today? I, what, was that the worship leaders that said, wake up! Don't go to sleep on this. We have everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness. So there is no excuse for us to disqualify ourselves from receiving everything that God has for us. Everybody say, I have everything I need. Everything. Glory to God. So when we receive Christ, we receive the fullness of Christ's nature. The divine nature of God is actually placed in us. And we become new creatures, 2 Peter 1 and 4. You, we are partakers of God's divine nature. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Ephesians 4, 24, Colossians 3 and 4. We have the DNA of God in us. Even though my flesh is not saved, in my spirit... I have God's DNA. I have his DNA. I'm a partaker of God's divine nature. I have a sin nature, but I also have a divine nature. Did you hear me? Yes. All right. Now watch this. Let's keep going here. Because, because when we receive Christ... We receive the fullness of life now. From the time we receive Christ, we should lack nothing. If we are ever in lack of anything, the fullness of life, it's because we have taken our eyes off of Christ when dealing with 
uh, day-to-day living. When we receive or when we receive Christ, we receive an abundance of life. John 10 and 10. The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life. And have it more abundantly. The Amplified Translation puts it like this. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life. And have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Woo! Glory to God. When we receive Christ, we receive the fullness of joy. John 15 and 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. When when the preacher says this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away from me. Come on, somebody. The reason why we can say that is because we have the fullness of his joy. Glory to God. Not only that, but when we receive Christ, we receive all the necessities of life, including food, clothing, and shelter. Matthew 6 and 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. When we receive Christ, we receive the fullness of God's spirit. Of God himself, Ephesians 3, 19 says to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Did you get that? We're filled with all the fullness, all of God we have been filled with because we are saved so you can't get any more of God in you than you already have in you so we have everything that we need because we have the fullness of God but watch this watch this look at what Paul also wrote in Ephesians uh, chapter number 5 and verse number 18 he says and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation but be Filled with the Spirit, capital S. Don't be drunk with wine. Mm, We'll talk about that maybe later on. Should I be drinking wine in the first place? Now don't get too quiet on me. Don't get too quiet. Stay, stay, keep your seat belts on. Stay in your seats. We're gonna hit some turbulence in a a little bit. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, We're gonna be we're gonna be just fine. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you keep your seatbelt on. <laughs> so when we receive Christ, we receive the fullness of life eternal. John 17, 3. And this is eternal life that you may know. That, wait a minute. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So we have the, listen. What is the fullness of eternal life? The fullness of eternal life is that because I have eternal life, eternal means never ending. It means that we will never die. Our bodies, our bodies fall asleep, but our spirit and our souls will never die. Did you get that? Because we've been quickened by the spirit, made alive unto God. Before salvation, we were spiritually dead. We were separated from God. But when we received Christ, our spirit was made alive. And now we have eternal life. We have the fullness. I can't get any more eternal life than I already have. So it would be futile for me to come up here and try to preach to you. Now you need to get saved, Brother Bozzi. You already saved. Can I get a amen? Says Carol, you need to get saved. Folk already saved. You already saved. How much more saved can you get? How much more eternal life can you have 
than what God has already given you. If you think that you can get more eternal life than you already have, you don't think what God has already given you is enough. So you got to add to it. And you can't. You'll never be able to add to what God has already given you. All right, all right. Now, Galatians 6 and 8 says, For he who sows to his flesh will reap of the flesh corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So what do you mean, sow to my flesh? When I walk in the flesh and not in the Spirit, I'm living a fleshly, carnal, and sinful life, and I'm sowing to my flesh. If I eat wrong all the time, I'm always eating stuff that's not healthy for me. Now, I know the Bible says that, and God told Peter this, don't call what I have declared clean, don't declare it unclean any longer. He was talking about them ribs that came down. <laughs> Pork. Can I get an amen? And I know a lot of us like to eat us some poke every now and then. Some ribs and poke chops. Bacon. Glory to God. <laughs> but you can't eat it every day. Can't eat it every day. Can't have bacon this morning and then have you some skins to snack on. Y'all know what pork rinds or cracklings and all that kind of stuff? Eat that later on tonight. And then tomorrow you, you go by McDonald's on your way to work. Oh, where's tomorrow is, is, um, is Memorial Day, so you don't have to go to work. So, you know, you get up and throw you some ribs on the pit. Pork ribs. Glory to God. Amen. You eat them pork ribs, you ate, you ate your whole slab of them. And then on Tuesday you go to work, stop by McDonald's and get you the sausage and egg McMuffin and all that kind of stuff. And then Wednesday, you know, for dinner, pork chops. No, 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 poke bones. Come on, somebody. <laughs> then Thursday, Thursday, pigtails. Pigtails and some black-eyed peas and yams and throw little greens on the side. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> Friday, y'all know everybody eat fish on Friday, but you got to have you some poke in there some kind of way so you get you a cob salad with some bacon on top of it. Sunday, I mean, Saturday rolled around. Well, uh, you know, we got to eat us a breakfast, baby. Get you some of them uh, pan sausage. <laughs> Pork pan sausage. And then in between, you got chitlins and pig knuckles and pickled pig feet and all that kind of stuff. Pig snorts. You can't do that. That's unhealthy. And then, you know, you, 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 you get your health all out of whack and all that. Now you got to call on God. In the church to pray for you so God can heal you. All right? So the flesh, um, well, let me back up just a little bit because we receive the fullness of the knowledge of God's will. First, I mean, Colossians 1 and 9, for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. God will fill you with his knowledge and, and the will of his wisdom and understanding, spiritual understanding. Now, the flesh fights for dominance. It lusts against the spirit uh, and it struggles and fights to control you. Your flesh wants to dominate you church and the picture is that of, of a tug of war the flesh stands contrary to the spirit of god toe to toe face to face and it seeks to control your life the word lust epithumia kata in the greek means a yearning passion for every one of us has experienced and do experience the flesh if these yearnings, these pullings, these desires, these warnings and cravings and hungers and thirsting and longing, grasping, grabbing and taking. How many of you understand what I'm talking about? Some of you are, right now, your flesh is crying out to you. You hungry, you want something to eat, you hope the preacher hurry up and get through so we can go eat something. 
Mm -hmm. That's why you need to yield to the spirit. Every person knows uh, what it is to have their flesh lusting after something, to have it yearning and yearning to lay hold of something. The flesh is very strong and difficult to control. This is the first reason why a believer's only hope to control his flesh is the spirit of God. Listen to what Paul wrote over in Romans chapter 7. Let's go over there right quick. Listen to what the apostle Paul Listen to what he wrote. The Apostle Paul who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. I want you to listen to this. Listen to what this man wrote. Listen to what his... How many of y'all, I ain't gonna... Now, don't raise your hand, but how many of your flesh is telling you to go and take that nap? Go and go to sleep. Go and go to sleep. He ain't, <laughs> he'll be all right. Go and go to sleep. Come on, you got to fight that flesh. Come on, tell your flesh, wake up. <laughs> Come on, tell him to wake up. Say, wake up, flesh, because I need to hear this. And now, now watch this. The devil can't make your flesh do anything. It just feeds the flame. He just, that's all he does, feed the flame. Girl, go on, go to sleep. <laughs> go on, go to sleep. <laughs> you ain't missing nothing. Romans, are you in Romans? No, did I say Romans 7? Look at verse number 14. And we're going to read down to verse 25 real quick. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold unto sin. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Anybody, can anybody identify with the apostle on that? Mm-hmm. Yes, for he, he goes on to say, uh, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells. And notice he said it's no longer I. I. He's talking about him, him, his spirit, the true essence of who he is. It's not I that do it, but it's sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Woo! For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Here the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, is talking about his struggle with sin. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now listen to what he, he says in that 8th chapter concerning this matter. Go down to verse number 5 of chapter number 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit if indeed, notice he said, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, 
He is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You have the spirit of God dwelling in you. Therefore, you have the power of God to put your flesh to death. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> Go to James chapter number four. James chapter number four. I have the power of God in me to make my body do what I tell it to do. Can you say amen today? James 1, look at verses 1 through 5. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on uh, your pleasures. Adulterers, adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. When I live a fleshly carnal life I am living a life of carnality and I am an enmity with God I have when when I want to be friends with the world I become an enemy of God let me close I cannot be a friend of the world the flesh is contrary to the spirit the flesh has within itself based on an unregulated urges and passions and emotions. However, as genuine believers, we have another force within us, the force of the Holy Ghost. And when we feel the constraint and the pressure between the flesh and the spirit, the Holy Ghost is giving us the power to overcome the flesh. The constraint is that power. And when we listen to the constraint and walk away from the object of the pressure, when we yield to the spirit, we call upon God to help us. And this is how we walk in the spirit. Paul goes on to tell us in this 17th verse of, of uh, the book of Galatians, chapter number 5. He says that the flesh keeps us from doing the things that we wish. Every person experiences the power of the flesh. Everyone has uh, carved into the flesh and done something that he did not want to do. You, ought to, you, you, you fought against doing it. You knew it was wrong. You knew it was harmful. You knew it was hurtful, yet you did it anyway. Uh, you didn't resist the flesh. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know you shouldn't have done that. No, you shouldn't have done it. No, you shouldn't have gone over that. But you went anyway. You know you shouldn't have made that phone call, but you made it anyway. Uh huh. Hmm. Hmm. You, look, look, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Particularly for those of us who are married people. You know, when, when your, your flesh is not saved. And when you're a married man, that don't mean you're not going to ever see other women who are beautiful. And, and your, your flesh, your sinful flesh, and your mind, if it's not renewed, will tell you, go and say something to her. 
Go and tell her how fine she is. Your mind will tell you that. But when you got the Holy Ghost in you, you feel that resistance and you don't do it. Now watch this. If you had a flirtatious personality before you got saved, guess what? That flirtatious personality is still there. You got, the, you got the Holy Ghost in you. And you were flirtatious when you were out there in the world and you see a good looking brother, sisters. You know, he, he, boy, he, ooh, Lord. The kind of men's I used to like when I was out there in the world. <laughs> hey, brother, how you doing? You just want to tell him. You just want to tell him. You know, I just, ooh, I wish I could. Oh, my God. But you feel that resistance. And what do you do? You shut that down. Look, I'm, look, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to make you think that those urges, those passions, those cravings are not still there. Your flesh is not saved. Yeah, she looked good. But I'm already married. I got a wife. She look even better. Come on, somebody. Woo! And that's how you have to deal with things. You got the power to shut that stuff down. So shut it down. Man, I've been, I've been with this woman for the last. Next month... It'll be 45 years that we've been together. In August, we'll be married 42 years. And I ain't never done that stuff. But that don't mean I never had desire. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? But I got the Holy Ghost. And I'm married to a woman that's crazy. <laughs> I ain't fixed to go out here and do stupid. Come on, somebody. That helps, Brother Bozy. <laughs> so if the bishop ever come up missing, y'all know he messed up bad. Where the bishop at? Is he still on sabbatical? <laughs> come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, let me go on on and close. <laughs> so, so when we walk in the flesh, it keeps us from doing the things that we know we ought to do. Let me close with this because it's important for us to understand that living a fleshly carnal life can also hinder our witness for Christ. When we live carnally, fleshly, the people in our lives who are not saved won't be attracted to him because of our witness. If we habitually drink and do drugs and fornicate and commit adultery, lie and cuss and steal and have no integrity, we vape and we do hookah and we dibble and dabble in witchcraft and so forth and so on, our witness will be weak for Christ. If we're putting stuff on social media that does not bring glory to God. We can't win our lost loved ones, our friends to him because they don't see how he has made a difference in our lives. Be a witness for Jesus. Let people see in your life who are not saved the difference that Jesus has made in your life. Walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of your flesh. God has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. You have the power of God living in you in the person of the Holy Ghost. You can live this life. You can live it. You can live it. Young people, please listen to me and perhaps some older folk too. 
Be careful what you put out there. Social media. You minister of the gospel. Or you get up here and you want to minister to people and yet you got stuff on social media on your table at the club. You got all that wine. You got, you know, liquor. And you got all the bottles. All the bottles. And, and you ain't sitting at the table witnessing to your drunk friends. You sitting there drinking with them. All y'all getting drunk. You'll never get them saved. You'll never get them saved. You'll never get them saved. Still smoking reefer with the guys you grew up with. You'll never get them saved. So don't you think that they need to be saved? Huh? You've been saved and you're still throwing games. <laughs> when you get with your boys, with your dogs, they're going to be in the game. They're not going to come out of the world. You're still throwing them gang signs. Because when you get around them, you just like them. Do you understand what I'm saying? That needs to be a change in us. And people need to see the change because if your loved ones and your friends who are lost don't get saved they are going to go to hell is that what you want from them is that what you want for them well then do what you need to do to live a saved life before them and stand to our feet